Welcome to the Faith Broadcast. I'm Carrick Butler. I lead Faith Christian Center right here in Austell, Georgia. Thank you for tuning in today. I believe today's message is going to equip you and empower you to make Jesus famous in your everyday life. As you listen, something good is going to happen to you. So listen up to the message, apply it, and I'll talk to you after today's message. Open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. We'll jump right in where we left off last week as we continue our verse-by-verse journey through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 18. And if you want to follow along with my notes, you can find them in our faith app. It's the third link on the first page. You just click the book of Acts, Faith Experience and Expansions, part 19, and it will open up in your browser, and you can follow along with me as well. So as we left off in Acts chapter 18, Paul had just got to Corinth. We had looked at his strategy we saw in chapter 17. In chapter 17, when he went to the synagogues of the Jews, he ministered to them line upon line, scripture upon scripture, precept upon precept. He was talking to word people, so he spoke to them as word people. It was scripture after scripture, quote after quote. But when he got to Athens, after he left the synagogue and he spoke in a mainly Gentile era with people who didn't know the scripture or didn't care about the scripture, he didn't open with the scripture as he did in all the other places. He began to, he started with their culture. He started with what they saw, what they understood, and eventually he brought them to the scripture, quoting it, bringing them to the point of salvation in Jesus, who we're saying it's all about. So one of the things I love about chapter 17 in the book of Acts, it gives you a window into Paul's strategy. The thing is, strategy is not a bad word to Pentecostals. God has given us a brain. We need to use it. Amen? And so there are things that are sudden inspirations by the Holy Ghost. But there are things that we're supposed to think and plan through as we're led and guided by the Holy Ghost. And we'll see some more of this in Acts chapter 18 because Paul was anointed, but he was also brilliant. He had a strategy, and he didn't always do the same thing in every single city. So Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. So he's still in Greece. And found a certain Jew by the name of Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius, had, the Caesar, had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. So he kicked all Jews out of Rome. And so these two Jews came to Corinth. And because he was of the same craft, Paul was trained to be a tent maker, as well as Aquila and Priscilla. He stayed with them and worked with them, for their occupation were tent makers. So one of the things you'll see here is Paul has gone through several different cities, and his team hasn't caught up with him yet. And so, all his funds run out. Because all he's been doing is preaching. And so, Paul likes to eat, apparently. Don't you like to eat? So, Paul goes back to one of the things he was trained in doing in making tents. And so, he happens to find other believers. And they make tents together, and they have this business going. And then on the Sabbath, Paul goes and preaches. And so, he was reasoning and persuading, as we looked at that word last week, the Jews and the Greeks... And when Silas and Timothy would come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, I was like, you know what? Your blood be on your own heads. I'm done with y'all. I'm clean. From henceforth, I'm going to the Gentiles. And you might say, well, he went far away from the synagogue. No, he went next door. <laughs> and he departed thence. And entered a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. He was literally right next door. Here's the synagogue's wall. Here's Justice's wall. It's together. So let's let you know Justice had an influential position within the synagogue. But then also Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. So many more Gentiles were saved than Jews. But then... The Lord spake to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak. Don't be quiet. Don't hold your peace. For I am with you, and no man. When I was looking up this word, no man, means not a single person shall set on you to hurt you. For I have much people in this city. So think about how important this is. We just read as a man, it's encouragement that Jesus appeared and encouraged him. But it's deeper than that. When we look at chapter 17 in the previous stops, Paul was there for maybe days or weeks. And when it ended, it was because there was a riot. People tried to kill him. And the believers sneak him out of the city. 
So Paul might be thinking, okay, cool, they've already rioted in the synagogue. How many times have they rioted in the street and somebody tries to kill me, somebody tries to stone me, someone tries to beat me? You know, he might be going through his mind going, well, what's about to happen next? But that night, Jesus appears after they, you know, rioted in the synagogue. He says, look, stay right here. Keep preaching. Don't be quiet. Nobody is going to touch you because I have much people in the city. And it's twofold when Jesus said that because there were a lot of people who just got saved. Where there are about to be a lot more who got saved. And so Paul stays put, not for a few weeks like he did in other cities, not for a few days like he did in Athens, a year and a half. This is his longest stop so far on his missionary journey, this one, teaching the word of God among them. So he's there 18 months, effective in ministry. And then when Galileo was a deputy of Rochea, he's the governor of the area, the Jews made an insurrection with one accord against Paul. So here comes the riot, like it always happens. And brought him to the judgment seat. They brought him to the judge. They're accusing him, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, he's about to defend himself. Paul's used to defending himself by now. You even look at some of Paul's letters, he defends himself in his letters. So he's used to defense, you know, He's like, okay, cool, I've been to court so many times before. So he's preparing his opening statement. He's about to open his mouth. And then the governor said to the Jews, if it was a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, oh, you Jews, wouldn't reason that I should bear with you or put up with you? But if it's a question of words and names and your law, you look at it. I'm not going to get involved. He says, why? He's like, why should I be involved? Now, he is a heathen's heathen. He doesn't care what they have to say. He doesn't care what the Jewish law means. He doesn't care about the different names. He's like, I could care less. He says, y'all deal with it. I ain't going to be bothered with y'all. Bye. So this is the Greek by Felicia. Because then he kicks them out of the judgment seat. Not by, he forces them out. He's like, I'm done with y'all. Then all the Greeks, because remember, they went to a Greek court, took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue. Because remember, the former chief ruler got saved, so he can't be the chief ruler no more. So there's a new chief ruler, Sothenes, who most people believed led the charge against Paul. They took him and beat him outside. So this is a first for Paul. Man, I'm not getting beat. <laughs> wow, no one's trying to stone me. No one's hitting me with clubs. Wow, well, look at that. I can walk away. And Galileo cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while. So he didn't even leave after this. He stayed for a while and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed in, into Syria and with, with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Syria, for he had a vow. Now notice this. Paul made a decision when he was ready to leave. All the other times, the believers scored him out. It's like, you got to go so they don't kill you. So notice the difference here Paul made a decision, like, you know what? Hey, I think I completed my mission. I'm not being forced out, but yeah, we're done. I'll see y'all in a little bit. So he heads back to Syria. Now, Paul describes his time in Corinth in his letters to the Corinthians. So let's look at some of the things he saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Because Paul writes two lengthy letters to the Corinthians, and a lot of these letters, he's correcting them. Now, Corinth wasn't known to be a moral city, as I've shared before. Corinth was a wild city. It was Las Vegas 3.0. Back in that time, they actually had a saying that if you had a wild Friday night, you acted like a Corinthian. So this is the city he was in and being effective in his ministry in this wild city, winning many people to Jesus throughout his time there. But one of the things, as Paul writes a letter to them later, he has to correct some of the things they've been doing. First, the strife. He deals with that in the first few chapters. And then he starts to answer their questions in chapter 7. But then he's correcting them again in chapter 9. But notice how he corrects them. Because remember, Paul in Corinth worked as a tent maker. Now, most people would think, well, if he started as a tent maker, well, once the church got going, he stopped being a tent maker. No. Chapter 9, verse 6. Remember, Paul's a man of strategy. No, he's defending himself in the letter. He says, or I only and Barnabas, have we not the power to stop working? Who goes to war any time at his own charges? Don't we pay soldiers to go forth? Who plants a vineyard and eats not of the fruit thereof? Who feeds a flock and eats not the milk of the flock? Say, I have these things as a man. Did I just come up with this by myself? Is this my own idea? 
Or doesn't the loss of Moses say, you shall not muzzle the mouth of an ox that shreds the corn? Does God take care for oxen? Or does he also care for us? For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he should plow, should plow in hope, and that he that threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we should reap of your carnal things? So if we preach you spiritual matters, shouldn't we reap natural things from you? If others be partakers of this power over you, you've let other preachers and ministers do that, don't you think it should belong to the one who helps you get to find Jesus in the first place? So notice how Paul is going through defending himself. He keeps going. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, this right that we have, but we suffer all things. We allow these things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ, Paul's strategy. It's like, I didn't take anything from you because I didn't want to stop what God was doing. Paul keeps going and says, do you not know they which minister about the holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar. So all the tithes and offerings that people brought in the Old Testament, they didn't just sit there and like rot or just be raptured to heaven. After they presented them, after they had the burnt offering, the priests ate them. This is what Paul's saying. Everything you brought to the temple, don't you know the priests used it? He says, even so, or in the same way, has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So Paul's belief is like, if your full time is preaching, then that's what you're supposed to live by. But he says, but I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things. I didn't even command you in this, that you should do this for me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, Paul's strategy. And to them which are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as a weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might be by all means save some. Paul's strategy. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? So run that you may win. And every man that strives for mastery is temperate in all things, now they do it to get a crown that is corruptible, is going to pass away. But we do it for an incorruptible crown. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one who fights the air. So Paul is talking about, I didn't take an offering, because I knew if I took an offering from you, it's going to ruin what God was doing in that city. Insight into Paul's strategy. Now some people say, well, Paul didn't believe in taking an offering. No. First Timothy 5.17 says, let the elders or the pastors and the ministers that rule well be counted worthy of double the honor. The word honor there means money paid. So he says double their salary, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine or teaching. For the scripture says you should not muzzle the ox that shreds out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. The word remains wages and pay for services. So Paul fully believed that those who preach the gospel and worked in ministry should be fully compensated. Yet in his work in Corinth and also in Thessalonica, he did not receive an offering for himself. Why? As we shared last week, Paul had a strategy. Now, go to chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. This is part of his strategy. He knew if he took an offering for them, it was going to ruin what was going on. Now, this is not what Paul did at every church. He received the offering from the Philippians. Now, he didn't want to because it was a poor church. And they had to beg him, no, you're going to take what we give. Now, of course, it caused a miracle for the Philippians. Well, there's other churches that Paul would receive gifts from all the time. But now you get to 1 Corinthians 16, because remember, Paul's still correcting the church at Corinth, getting them in line. It says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, this is what you're going to do. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So I don't want y'all trying to put together an offering by the time I get there. Every week, every Sunday, I want you to give. But also know Paul's expectation. He expected that they were going to prosper every week. 
A lot of times now we think we're going to prosper every other week because that's when we get paid. Here's a scripture you can stand on to have increase every single week. This is Paul's Holy Ghost expectation for the church at Corinth. And if the Holy Ghost can expect at the church at Corinth, you know he can expect at the church at Austell. And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality, the hump of your gift, unto Jerusalem. And if it be me that I go also, they shall go with me. Now when I come to you, when I pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and that it might, and it may be that I will abide again winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey where the sorrow I go. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I must tear a while with you, if the Lord permit. Notice two things Paul said here. He said, you're going to take an offering every week for this outreach that we're going to minister to the people here. But when I come, y'all going to help me go to my next city. Bring me on my way. It's, in the Greeks, it's you're going to aid me. Or in other words, you're going to pay for my next trip. So notice what Paul did. As he started the church, he didn't take something from them. He's trying to get them going. He knew that with this city, if I take an offering for them, it's going to ruin what God's doing. But now that I've matured them, now that I've grown them, now I'm correcting them, now you're not only are you going to give to my ministry, but you're also going to give to missions. This is what Paul's doing here in Corinthians. But he doesn't even stop there. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Because, you know, once Paul says, you know, we're going to give towards missions and everything, they, you know, they get... They're like, yeah, we're going to give. Corinthian is a prosperous church. Oh, man, we're going to give a big offering. Yeah, it's going to be a great offering. So they start talking junk. So all of other Paul's churches hear about how they're bragging about the offering they're going to take up. And all the other churches get excited. Man, of course it's going to do it. We're going to do it. And so all the other churches send in their offerings. But Paul has to write them and say, hey, you know, about a year ago, you said you were going to do this offering, but y'all ain't done nothing. Put your money where your mouth is. And then he goes on and talks to them, because you see that in chapter 8 and chapter 9. But part of chapter 8, it says, Moreover, brethren, we want you to know about the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Those are the churches. Those are the Philippians. How that in their great trial of affliction, this great pressure in their circumstances, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. This is a broke church. Now, you got to think, why is this church poor? Does God just want people to be poor? No. Think about the circumstances that birthed the church at Philippi. A lot of these people were ex-convicts. They just got out of jail. Some people believe the pastor was the former warden. There are a few people in that church who have money, like Lydia and a few others, but most of them originated from the jail. So they come to church. They don't have anything yet. But it was this group that received a big offering and sent it to Paul. Praying us or begging us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship or the partnership of the ministering to the saints. And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And so much that we desire Titus that as he had begun, so he would finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, the gifts of the Spirit, graces of God, and in all diligence and in your love towards us, see that you abound in this grace also. What grace? The grace of giving. So Paul sent Titus to Corinth to teach an unending series about giving. Think about this. Paul's like, I'm not there yet, but I'm a preacher, and all he's going to preach to you about is giving. Who knows how long that series lasted? Tyson, I'm going to keep saying the same thing until y'all do it. So this is what he did. Because he was getting the church of Corinth in line about their giving. So some people, you know, some people are erroneous today. say, you know, churches shouldn't talk about money. Well, they must not read the Bible. There's, you know, there's more scriptures about money in the Bible than heaven. Money is important. And if you shouldn't talk about money in the Christian church, you should, someone should have told the Apostle Paul. He must have been mistaken. Because he talked about it a lot. How many people you know send a guest speaker to only talk about money for months? Months. I sent Titus to finish it, to complete it. So he's going to keep preaching till you get it. And notice he's not just talking about just giving. He's talking about there's a grace for it. This is a church that had different gifts of the Spirit. They're excelling at the things of the Spirit. 
But it's like I heard Dad Hagen said, he says, one time I saw this guy, he came to a meeting, got full of the Holy Ghost, got healed, set free, ran, danced, rolled around the church, and not a penny fell out of his pocket. <laughs> he was talking about, he did all these things, got super blessed, and didn't give a dime. And I was like, Paul is correcting the church at Corinth here. He's correcting about a lot of things that we focus on, but he's also correcting them about their giving. And he's talking about there's a grace for giving. And so he points, he says, you prosperous church, look at this church that had nothing, and they're out giving you. And so Paul goes on in chapter 8 about it and in chapter 9. But let's go back to Acts 18. Start with verse 17 again. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him. Remember, we just talked about him about 20 minutes ago. Before the judgment seat. And Galileo cared not for none of these things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed into, uh, into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn us in a century, for he had a vow. So remember we said it's, it's thought that Sosthenes led the charge against Paul. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother the person who led the charge against Paul is now by Paul's side so don't tell me who God can't save God can take your chief enemy and make them your partner in the ministry because Paul's writing the letter to Corinth. He said, yeah, and hey, Sosthenes is with me. Because you read the end of Paul's shout-outs, he adds a lot of people. He has a lot of shout-outs at the end of his letters. He said, hey, so-and-so says hi. So-and-so says hi. Oh, yeah, uh, your mama said this and this and this. He said all these things at the end. But at the very beginning, sometimes it's from Paul and Timothy. But now this is from Paul and Sosthenes. He's now a brother. So verse 18 of chapter 18. Well, now let's go down to verse 19. So Paul comes to Ephesus, and he leaves there Aquila and Priscilla. But he goes to the synagogue, and he reasons with the Jews. This is, remember, this is a strategy. When he gets to the city, he go, first place, he goes to the synagogue. And when they begged him and desired him to tarry longer with them, he didn't agree. But he says, I have to go. I really want to go and keep the feast that comes in Jerusalem. But I will come back to you if this is what God wants me to do. And he left Ephesus. But when he landed at Caesarea... And gone up, he saluted the church. He went down to Antioch. Remember, that was the home base. And after he spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and in Phrygia. Remember, he was there at the beginning of the trip, strengthening all the disciples. So Ephesus and Galatia and Phrygia, this is all in modern-day Turkey. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, it's North Africa, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So Apollos is a gifted preacher. He is eloquent. Some people said he has a silver tongue. You know, there's some people who can preach and things just rhyme. They don't even try and it just rhymes. They have all these $20 words, and it just flows together. They're just gifted that way. This is Apollos. He's just gifted that way. He stands up and he's smart. He's trained in Alexandria, which is a center for education of the day. So one of the people said because of the philosopher who lived there, he probably had an allegorical style. So he's using a lot of allegories and his preaching. And now he's deep, but he knows how to connect with the people. He is a gifted man of God. So he gets there and starts preaching and teaching and sharing accurately the things of the Lord and the way of Jesus. But... His knowledge is limited because when it comes to baptism, he only knows about the baptism of repentance. And so he's preaching because he's speaking boldly in the synagogue. And then Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They pulled him aside, hey, come here for a second. And they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. One of the things let's know about Apollos, he was humble. Although he was gifted, and this dude was gifted, he let others teach him. So say, hey, you know, you're doing pretty good. Yep, that's right. But there's some more you've got to know about. You know, when Jesus ascended, he sent the Holy Ghost. 
So he's teaching them. The Aquila and Priscilla are teaching him these things. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, he's going to Corinth, the brethren of Ephesus were also. So there are people who got saved under his ministry. There are people getting saved under Aquila and Priscilla's ministry. This church writes to the, those who are in Corinth, remember the church Paul started, that they would receive Apollos when he was come. So when he, Apollos gets to Corinth, he helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Remember in Corinth, Paul left the synagogue and said, I'm done with y'all in Corinth. I'm going to the Gentiles. Apollo shows up at the same synagogue and refutes every single argument. All the things that Paul didn't handle, Paul's like, I got this. And they couldn't defeat his logic. He publicly and in the synagogue said Jesus is the Christ, and nobody could disagree with him. So the church of Corinth is growing even more. As Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians, I sowed Apollo's water. So now there's more Jews getting saved. There's more Gentiles getting saved. But one of the things you see of Apollos' ministry, one of his strongest anointings is among the Jews. That's one of the areas he's anointed to minister. Paul is anointed to minister to the Jews, but that's not number one. Gentiles, kings, then the Jews. You can be anointed in different areas, but have a primary calling, have a primary anointing. But the thing is, you can do all these different things, but no, there'll be different results. So Paul, Paul wasn't hurt that Apollos was successful. He says, great, who's Paul? Who's Apollos? We're just ministers of God sent. Who's Peter? He's just a minister of God sent. We're all yours in Christ. So Paul didn't have hurt feelings that Apollos was successful, and Apollos didn't care that Paul was successful. They knew their mission to grow the body of Christ. They operated in their anointings, in their giftings, to grow the body of Christ. So you go to chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and he found certain disciples, most likely they were one under the ministry of Apollos. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, oh, we, have, we don't even know that there's a, there's a Holy Ghost, a Holy Who? So Paul, I mean, Apollos, when he preached, preached on Jesus. He got them saved. But he didn't preach about the Holy Ghost. He preached about Jesus. They knew about Jesus. They're believers. But after Aquila and Priscilla explained to Apollos, hey, this is what you need to know, he left Ephesus and went to Corinth. So there's still believers in Ephesus who haven't heard the fullness of the gospel. They're saved. They're going to heaven, but they don't know there's a Holy Ghost. Even though the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of them, they still don't realize there's a Holy Ghost. And so then Paul gets confused. So I said, wait a minute, so what were you baptized with? He said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. So notice what happened. Two baptisms occurred here. Paul baptizes them in water. But Matthew 3 says Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Ghost. So right after Paul gets him out of the water, Paul is laying their hands on him, and Jesus says, now it's my turn. Whoosh, Holy Ghost in the fire. So Apollo started right, getting them saved. But now by the time he left, his knowledge was limited. So Paul builds on what Apollos did. But Apollos goes to Corinth and builds on what Paul did. There's not supposed to be competition in the body of Christ. We're supposed to build on what each other knew. And so Paul comes into Ephesus and starts a revival. He's building on the work of Corinth. Uh, in Cor uh, he's building on the work in Ephesus that Aquila, Priscilla, and Apollos did. And it breaks out into a wildfire. It becomes the largest church in the East. One of the largest churches in New Testament times. And it lasts for decades. But it wasn't just Paul's ministry. It was also Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla. One of the things you have to take this in your own personal life, understand you are anointed to do something. 
find out what your anointing is. Find out the order of the call of God on your life. You know, as a minister, I stand in multiple offices. And there's some anointings on my life that are stronger than others. And there's some anointings God will pull out at different places. You know, there's certain countries I go into and God will have me operate in one way. All the places have me do other things. Here, have me do other things. It's not that, oh, you're only anointed on certain days. No, there's certain anointings God wants to bring forth at certain times. So there are anointings on your life. And some for different seasons. Because Paul started, as we taught earlier in the series, he's a prophet and a teacher. Then he becomes an apostle. Then he begins to write letters for the church. And I said, well, did Paul stop becoming a prophet and a teacher and become an apostle? No. The anointing just kept growing. So you're not supposed to stay at one level of the anointing. The anointing is supposed to grow and to increase. But you must get before God and find out what is the anointing that's on your life and what is your priority. See, maturity in God is not saying, well, picking right from wrong. It's sometimes picking right from right. And what is more best for the moment. Because you can be anointed to do a lot of things. There's a lot of options before you. But what is best at this moment? So get before God and find out about the anointing that's on your life. And know how it's supposed to operate. Because also there's anointings that will be on your life because of the legacy that you come from. There's anointings on my life that I'm anointed to because of who I am in God. But also, in my lineage where I come from, there's anointing. Bishop's anointing on me. I've had his anointing since I was 13. I grew up in that anointing to the point that sometimes it's so strong, I'm like, well, when did Bishop walk in the room? <laughs> and some people on my staff go like, ooh, look, yeah, that's Bishop. And like, you know, we're all looking. I remember we had one of our interns who made it a meme, and they said, oh, and they posted it. like, yep, he's on his Bishop Butler today. I was like, well, thanks, guys. But it's that anointing that came in the room. And there's other people that I've learned from in impartation from Oral Roberts. I'm part of his legacy. And so sometimes his anointing comes on. And the thing is, I learned to begin to recognize it. I remember one time I was at this uh, graduation party in Texas, and I was laying hands on someone and praying for them. And there was another couple who was praying for them, but they said, they said, Carrick, as you prayed, their bones began to move. And they said, last time we heard about that was under Oral Roberts. And I'm like, I'm one of his graduates. So you can have multiple anointings on your life. You have to learn to acknowledge them. You have to learn to talk about them. Because they're not just anointings for ministry. They're anointings for business. There's anointings for in the medical field. There's anointings in the education field. There's anointings wherever you are. You have to find out what you're anointed to do and talk about it. Because there's some things that are just easy for you. And it doesn't mean just as a talent. There's a grace for it, meaning there's an anointing for it. You need to find out what you're anointed for and start talking about it. Because when you run into a problem that you can't figure out with your mind, you remember, wait a minute, I'm anointed for this. That's bird removing, yoke destroying power on me for this assignment. So I speak to the anointing within me and on me, move this thing out the way. And then anointing go into work. You have to remember you're a Christian, you're a Christian. You identify with the anointed one which means you identify with saying that you're anointed. It can't just be the preacher who's anointed. It's all of us. You're the body of Christ. You're the body of the anointing. You have to acknowledge the anointing that's on your life. You have to talk about it, especially with people who are of like faith. So I don't know who to talk about. Well, tell yourself about it. Look in the mirror and say, yeah, you're anointed. Man, do you know how anointed you are today? John G. Lake would wake up every morning. He liked wearing nice suits of clothes, so he'd get dressed in his suit of clothes and put to himself in the mirror and says, God lives in those suit of clothes. Where that man goes in that suit of clothes, God goes. That's what he did every morning. He's reminding himself who lived within him. He's reminding himself of the anointing. The anointing makes the difference. Hype is cool, but hype doesn't set people free. The anointing removes burdens.
the anointing destroys yokes. And the anointing is not just present at church. You just have to learn how to work in it. I had someone, I think it was earlier this week, come to do some work at my house, and he was telling me about, um, he was a believer, he was telling me about some surgery he had recently on his shoulder. And I said, well, let me go ahead and speed your recovery along. And so I put my hand on his shoulder and I began to pray for him. A quick prayer, 15 seconds. And you might say, oh, it was a very spiritual adversary. Not really, you know, there was a, uh, where I was was near a golf course, and the person in the golf cart was playing Eminem and D12. So <laughs> that song was bumping in the background. I said, oh, yeah, I remember that song. So let me focus on prayer real quick. <laughs> So it wasn't some spiritual atmosphere. <laughs> but as I prayed and acknowledged the healing anointing, he told me after he walked away, I said, whoa, I felt the heat come from your hand. I said, yeah, that's how it works. He said, it went right into my shoulder. And yeah, it's feeling better. Yeah, I'm anointed. Not just one of my church. You have to learn to acknowledge the anointing. You know, one of the things I remember, um, my wife would do this sometimes. We'll be watching TV, and let's say she has some type of pain in her body. She just grabbed my arm. I'm like, what, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I knew how to get healed. And she did. And so I was like, I just kept watching NCIS. I'm like, cool, let me enjoy myself. You know, <laughs> you be blessed. <laughs> but you're not just supposed to be anointed at church. You have to learn how to acknowledge the anointing and live in it. And know how to stand on it. Because the anointing is coming strong. But it doesn't mean God wants you to fall out. There's times when it's time for you to fall out. But other times... You're supposed to learn how to stand on the anointing. I remember about a month ago or a couple months ago, the Holy Ghost was doing something. He says, move out the way. I'm about to come in a strong way. I said, cool, knock me out. He's like, no, you got some work to do. So I need you to stand <laughs> and move out the way. <laughs> learn how to cooperate with the power of God. And it's not always something spooky. Part of operating the power of God is just knowing who you are. I know who I'm Christ. I'm anointed. Whether I feel it or not, I'm anointed. Now, when I laid hands on that brother, did I feel the anointing go on my hand? No, but I knew it did. Why? I prayed. Jesus heard me. I'm anointed. You have to have that confidence that when you do what God has called you to do, the anointing is working. And whatever you set your hands to do, the anointing is working. So find out what you're anointed to do and do it. And talk about the anointing. The more you talk about the anointing, the more aware of it you become. If I took more time to talk about the anointing, it ain't keep on increasing and increasing and increasing in this room. Why? If you acknowledge him, he'll direct your paths. And so one of the things I did when I was doing itinerant ministry, while I was still at ORU, when I would minister to these places, I would imagine all the different men and women of God who laid hands on me. So what I'm doing, I'm stirring up the gifts within me. So I saw Bishop and Pastor Deborah. I saw Pastor Andre and Minister Tiffany. I would see the Copelands. I would see Sister Billy Brim. I would see Tim Story. I'd see Benny Hinn. I would see, I'd go through all these lists of people who've prayed over me for the years. I'd see Marilyn Hickey. I'd see Hilton Sutton. I would see the Roberts family. I would see the Frazones. I would look at all these people in my mind, and I would imagine them laying hands on me. And I said, Father, I thank you for the impartation I received from your servants. And I call every grace and anointing and impartation stirred up for what I need to do in this meeting tonight. What I'm doing, acknowledging the anointing. And I'll step out and the anointing will work. And the Holy Ghost will move. What do I do? I just acknowledge him. And it's not just for ministry. It's for whatever you're called to do. If you're called to do something, there's an anointing for that region. There's an anointing for that realm. You need to talk about it. No one else may understand it, so don't talk to them about it. Stir up that anointing. There's an anointing to be a parent. There's an anointing, especially if you're stepping in a row and you're not a parent, but you have to step in the row. There's still an anointing on you to do it. So acknowledge that anointing to parent or to be a grandparent. Because people say, oh, I just can't reach my child. Well, no, you're anointed to do so. I remember when I was a youth pastor in Texas, uh, I was standing with uh, some parents, and uh, they were talking to Bishop about something they had a child. I was like, oh, yeah, have them talk to the too. He's anointed to get in their minds. I'm like, oh, I am? Well, I guess I am. So what I do? I got in their minds. I figured out what was going on. The anointing can do that. Talk about the anointing. Acknowledge it. It should be on your mouth every day. I am anointed. I am anointed. I am anointed. 
because you're not talking big about you. You're talking about big of what God put on you. Talk about the anointings on your life. You know, when I go minister in different places, you know, it started years ago, and I found it kind of funny after I realized a pattern that they expected wherever I showed up to be moves of the Holy Ghost and that people would hit the ground. To the point I was ministering in Austin, and they said, you know, anytime you get up to preach, we have an extra, a third extra lap cloth laid out. I'm like, what? <laughs> I said, you guys have a number? I said, oh, yeah, we have a number. <laughs> and then I go to other places. Well, this is how many people are serving down on the ushers team. So, you know, just so you know. I remember I ministered at Word of Faith years ago on a Sunday, and they didn't expect it. The second time I stepped off the altar, there were like 10 ushers at my side. Oh, we're ready for you this year. I'm like, oh, well, excuse me. But they believed in the anointing, so I might as well. I was at FX earlier this year, and they said, yeah, however you want to flow. So we got people trained and ready. If you want to, call them up this way. You just follow the Holy Ghost. And the anointing worked. It was a different way. People just stood up and started getting healed. Just like that. We start calling out, and people were getting healed just like that. The anointing works no matter where you are. So you have to acknowledge it. Amen. I hope you enjoyed today's message. Thank you once again for tuning in today. You know, if you enjoyed the message, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Download our Faith Christian Center Georgia app. As well as follow us on social media. And if you want to partner with us as a ministry, you can text FCCJ to 73256. That's FCCJ to 73256. And you can give financially to support this ministry and what we do here in the metro Atlanta area as well as all around the world. Once again, thank you for tuning in today, and I'll see you next time.